Hello and welcome to today's lesson. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of drilling. So what do you remember about what we've covered so far in terms of uh, World War One? Here's 10 questions. See how many of them you can remember. Okay, here are the answers. Did you get all 10? Now today we're going to be looking at um, medical hospitals. Okay, uh, so first thing I'd like you to do is just to watch this little clip here. And it'll give you an idea of the experience of medical hospital during World War One. So today we're going to start looking at two of the most important organisations in terms of medicine on the Western Front, um, which is the Royal Army Medical Corps and the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, and we're going to be seeing uh, what they were doing. We're going to have an introduction to the chain of evacuation. So let's start off with the RAMC and the FANY. So the RAMC was the Royal Army Medical Corps. It was a branch of the army that was responsible for medical care. It had been founded in 1898, um, but this was basically the doctors. More than half of Britain's doctors were serving in the armed forces, and most of those were deployed to the Western Front. Okay, so the RAMC, it's the, all the male doctors. I say male because, of course, women at this period wouldn't have been doctors. Women were, however, present and really important in the medical treatment of the Western Front, but they were part of a different organisation called the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry. Now this was founded in 1906 and it was a voluntary organisation. The idea was that women volunteered to go out and help on the Western Front and they were primarily acting as uh, nurses, I suppose. So they provided the immediate frontline support, um, so that kind of immediate first aid. But they also did other things like uh, driving ambulances and even uh, providing baths to soldiers. So they, they were a really important part of the medical team. Initially, when they uh, first arrived, the, the British didn't want to use them at all. Uh, so they you, they helped French and Belgian soldiers, but eventually the British came to their senses and did make use of um, the first aid nursing yeomanry's resources. So, uh, using the information that you've just read through, complete these questions here. So now we've had an introduction to the two organisations who were providing medical care on the Western Front. Now we're going to look at what we call the chain of evacuation. Now it was really important that as soon as a man was wounded, he get medical treatment ASAP. This would prevent you know, blood loss, um, shock from pain, and importantly, infection. You've got to deal with that very quickly. So they needed to come up with an efficient system to get the injured man away from the front line and to medical treatment. And this system they came up with is known as the chain of evacuation. Now there are loads of different stages and I'm going to take you through each stage and what would happen at that stage um, in a moment. Not every man would go through all of these. Um, you know, some wounds would be able to be treated along the uh, chain of evacuation and then you would be returned back to the front line. Um, sometimes they might miss a step. It, you know, this is the, the, the basic outline. So this diagram here shows you uh, the chain of evacuation. So the stretcher bearers would remove the man from 
no man's land and taken on foot to the regimental aid post. Here he would receive some basic first aid before being moved via motor ambulance to a dressing station or to a casualty clearing station. From there, they'd be moved via base, hos um, sorry, through a hospital train or through a canal barge up to a base hospital and then potentially from that base hospital even back to Blighty, back to Britain. So that's the fancy Edexcel version. Here's my version here. I quite like this one. So what I'd like you to do is make your own copy of this beautiful diagram showing us the different stages of the chain of evacuation. If you can, you could uh, print off this slide and fill it in. Now I'm going to be talking a lot about um, dressing stations and we just need to get one thing clear before we move on. Uh, a dressing station was part of a unit of the RMC called field ambulances. So a field ambulance wasn't the physical vehicle that moved um, sick and wounded men around. We call that an ambulance wagon. Okay. So the first stage in the chain of evacuation was the RAP or the regimental aid post. Now this was typically located within 200 metres of the front line in communication trenches or deserted buildings. It was made up of a regimental medical officer with some help from stretcher bearers with first aid knowledge. Wounded men would either walk in themselves or be carried in by other soldiers. The purpose of the RAP was to give immediate first aid and to get as many men back to the fighting as possible. It could not deal with any serious injuries. So if you had a serious injury, you'd have to be moved on up to the next stage of the chain of evacuation. The next stage uh, was the dressing station. So in theory, there should have been an advanced dressing station about 400 metres from the RAP and then a main dressing station a further half a mile back. So as we go down the chain of evacuation, we'll see, you'll see we're moving further and further away from the front line. In practice, it can always turn out that way. Not often the case, really. Um, there may have only been one dressing station. But where possible, the dressing stations were located in abandoned buildings, dugouts or bunkers in order to protect from enemy shelling. When they weren't available, tents would be used. Each dressing station would be staffed by 10 medical officers plus medical orderlies and stretcher bearers. From 1915, there were also some nurses available at this part of the, the chain of evacuation. So we can see that it's an improvement upon the aid being offered at the RAP. Um, you would either walk to a dressing station or potentially be carried um, by a stretcher bearer. So here's an image of a dressing station here. So, the next stage was the casualty clearing station. Now, casualty clearing stations were located at a sufficient distance from the front line to provide some safety from attack, but they were still close enough to be accessible by ambulance wagons. Often, the casualty clearing station closest to the front line would specialise in operating on the most critical injuries, such as those to the chest. They had to do that because... If you don't operate on those kind of things immediately, the patient's going to die before you manage to move them up further the chain of evacuation. The casualty clearing stations were set up in buildings such as factories or schools and were often located near to a railway line to allow the next stage of the chain of evacuation to take place quickly. <laughs> 
when wounded soldiers arrived at the casualty clearance station, they were divided into groups. And this was a system called triage. Now, when you go into A&E today, you still get triage. They um, prioritise those who most desperately need the help. And that's exactly kind of what's happening here. Um, so triage actually comes from the French word for sorting. So you get triaged into one of three categories. You could be the walking wounded, who could just be patched up and then returned back to fighting. You could be those who are in need of hospital treatment, and so you would be moved on up to a base hospital. Or you would be, unfortunately, those who will not survive. So men who you just make comfortable, but you don't really waste medical resources on them because you know there's nothing you can do. Here are some useful statistics about the CCS during the Third Battle of Ypres in 1917. There were 24 CCSs in the Ypres salient. 379 doctors and 502 nurses treated more than 200,000 casualties and the medical staff operated on 30% of the men who were admitted. In total, 3.7% of, of the men admitted died. The next stage in the chain of evacuation was the base hospital. Now, base hospitals were located near the French and Belgian coasts so that the wounded men who were treated there would be close to the ports from which they could be transported home to Britain. At the start of the war, there were two types of base hospital, the stationary hospital and the general hospital. However, in practice, they worked in very similar ways. Men were treated in both types of hospital until they could be returned to Britain for further treatment or were fit enough to return to the fighting. As the war progressed, casualty clearing stations played an increasingly important role in dealing with wounds instead of base hospitals. It had become clear that if contaminated wounds were not dealt with quickly, wounded men were more likely to develop gangrene. This meant that the CCS started doing operations that it originally believed would be done in the base hospitals. By 1916, for example, at number 26 General Hotel at Tap, <laughs> most head and chest patients had been operated upon before their arrival at the base hospital there. In turn, the base hospitals became increasingly responsible for continuing treatment that was begun in the CCSs before men were either returned to frontline fighting or transported back to Britain. The size of the base hospitals increased, especially after a major offensive had taken place. In 1917, three new base hospitals with a total of 2,500 beds were available. As the base hospitals were not carrying out their intended role, other important roles emerged for them. They experimented with new techniques, which, once successful, were then moved further down the chain of evacuation to be used, for example, in the CCSs. One example would be dividing patients up into different wards according to their wounds, such as amputees, head wounds, chest wounds, and then allocating a doctor to a specialised ward. So the doctor became an expert in treating a particular kind of wound. So here's a photograph of a base hospital. Now the most um, well-known perhaps hospital uh, on the Western Front was the Underground Hospital at Arras. Now hopefully you remember Arras from our first lesson when we started looking at the different uh, battles that were taking place. Now in November 1916, tunnelling began under the town of Arras. In 800 metres of tunnels, a fully working hospital was created so close to the front line that it was, in reality, a dressing station. From here, wounded soldiers would move through the chain of evacuation. It was sometimes called Thompson's Cave, after the RAMC officer who was responsible for equipping it. There were waiting rooms for the wounded, 700 spaces where stretchers could be placed as beds, an operating theatre, rest stations for stretch bearers and a mortuary to lay out the dead. Electricity and piped water were supplied to the hospital 
The hospital was abandoned during the Battle of Arras in 1917 when it was hit by a shell which destroyed the water supply but luckily did not injure any people. So that's your explanation of the chain of evacuation. Your tasks for the, this lesson are firstly to copy the chain of evacuation down from slide 13. Secondly, to complete the questions on the RAMC and the FANY. And thirdly, to complete the table on the chain of evacuation in your booklet. And it should be page 1415.